And I'm starting to notice that the same thing happens with tea, but it's not in what style you drink. That's just, you know, whatever you decide to go with. It's literally in the teaware. <sighs> Like I, I just like just I have tea-ware. noticed some style, like tea style, and and a lot of that has to do with the vendors that are educating True. the market. Um, but like you know, you got the pusers, and you know, once they <laughs> discover pu'er, that's like it. You know, yeah, that's it. I don't understand that either. Like show pu'er specifically. Yeah, I mean, there's even vendors like peers of mine in the industry that i've given them gifts of very like unique teas that like you can't find anywhere else and like it's really special and it's just a small amount this is just enjoy it for a special thing and they'll say hey don't give this to me i won't drink it i only drink pu'er even people in the business and it's like you're missing out on you know even if you don't like the tea that's fine but like it's educational and if you're working in tea like tasting different teas like what we're doing here is like very um, important for your continued education. Well, I think that specifically, so something that I'm always kind of talking, you see Liquid Pros to Bourbon Barrel HD. I have, and that is what I will say about that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, uh, so something that I'm talking, I talk about a lot is like, the 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 whole fact that like tea is this like beautiful like expression of land you know and I feel like honestly the the pu'er specific, specifically like the show pu'er um, is um, like so processed and so fermented that it's not that and so to only drink that to me feels like you're like doing a disservice to yourself and to the plant but maybe that's just me also being a snob. <sighs> I don't think I don't think that's snob behavior. I don't think so. Maybe it's purist behavior. Who knows? <laughs> I got that. I just like I just think it's more of an open mindedness type of thing that mm-hmm. I like to focus on. It's like yeah, you may not ever pursue the business of oolong. You're only going to do the business of pu'er, but drinking oolongs makes it you know a lot easier. Agreed. All right, give me half a second Mm because I forgot to uh, turn off my AC. Okay. So I will go do that. You're going to sweat. Uh, Wheezy, thank you for that heads up about the audio. Thank you for that. Wheezy, how are you doing today? This is a live podcast that we're recording. We record this every Monday night. I'm here with my friend Colin. Um, We met on TikTok. (laughs) And we meet every Monday night, and uh, we drink two different teas side by side, uh, or not side by side, but we just drink two different teas and um, talk about the terroir, talk about where it comes from, uh, talk about our impressions on the tea, and try to make some type of educational discovery about about tea through this process. Um, and so these pairings are parallels their contrast and their complements to each other and so today we are drinking uh two broken grade black teas now i thought this would be interesting calling because we've talked about this before you've met you've talked about you know like the broken grades kind of being a lower grade and it's for the most part true like when it comes to like ctc fannings dust a lot of times those are lower grades but broken grades can also be made on an artisanal level like these uh, tonight that we'll look at. So we're going to be looking at one from Malawi, Africa, and another one from Sri Lanka. Wait, what? It's from Sri Lanka. Did I? I said Vangetto Pe- Ven- Vangetti Peco, right? Oh, um, or did no. Or did I do the Satemwa? <laughs> you did the Satemwa TSFBOP1 and the Theolo TSFBOP1. Um, I can go. I can go see if I have that up one real quick. I think that would make a, the conversation more interesting. I'm sorry, I made that mistake. You're okay. You're okay. Let me yeah, go check yeah. The, you have that Vangetti Peco. Yeah, let's let's yeah. do that one. That'll be a good contrast. Um, <laughs> uh, Colin and I both have very busy schedules, so the planning for this podcast is is limited in capacity. But uh, grateful to have you all here. Uh, my name is Elise. I am a tea importer. I've been doing tea importing for close to a decade now. I run a software company that is a B2B marketplace between independent tea growers 
and T business buyers. So for the most part, I do wholesale, um, you know, so just kind of back end supply chain. Did you get it? Yes. Wonderful. Um, which, Thank you. Which, so which uh, Malawi one are we doing? Well, let's do the Cholo one. The which one? The Cholo. Cholo. Oh, is that how you pronounce that? Yes. <laughs> Ah, good to know. <laughs> it always trips people out because they they call it Theolo. It's it's spelled T H Y O L O. Theolo is what it looks like, but uh, in in the the local language there, it's uh, Cholo, and that's like the district that they're in. It's it's sure. called the Cholo district, which is why they call it that. Let me measure this out. <laughs> oh, you're so exact. I don't measure mine. I just eyeball I... it. I measure on my first, like, go of a T. And by the way, I've got the live symbol on, so like we are recording now. If you're yes. up for it, yep. and like, so I, this this might be a good way to start off our conversation too. Um, just I, when I'm first making a T, um, I like to measure out exactly, and then um, like kind of pay a lot of attention. I'll often like write down as well, kind of what I did. Um, so the next time I come back to this, I can experiment on that. And I remember that. Um, and I've met a lot of people recently that um, don't do that, um, such as yourself, which is totally valid, obviously, because mm -hmm. who cares how you make tea as long as you're enjoying it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for me, that's like a much more enjoyable process because um, I, you know, growing up, my mother was a math teacher. So everything was like basically like a science experiment half the time. So, you know, like that's this kind of like one of the enjoyment of like trying a tea for the first time for me is kind of getting to like play with the, the measurements a little bit. Yeah, so, no, I get that. I get that. I, I support it. I think it's cool. Um, I've just like I've brewed and drank these teas uh, dozens of times. Yeah. In my, the in teas my that I know, <laughs> I never, I never pull the scale out for. Yeah, because you just know you have an intuition for it, yeah. you know, and that's that's like the theme of the tea education that I'm always uh, trying to put out in, in our content is, is more about intuition than it is about exactness and memory and, you know, everything you being perfect. Tea. Yeah, know your tea. And the best way to do that is just by drinking the teas, uh, especially if you're drinking teas as like a pairing, like how we are. Sure. It's really helpful. Um, so yeah, sometimes we're drinking teas coming from the same place. They're just different teas coming from the same garden or sometimes like today, they're the same type of teas coming from very different gardens and having very different stories um, of how those tea styles were uh, developed. I have warm teaware. You have what? I have warm teaware. What's your one teaware for tonight? Oh, so you want to? No, I have I have warm teaware. Oh, warm, good. Okay, I'll get mine warm yes. too. So you're ready to jump right into it. Yeah, I am. <laughs> do you want to do them one at a time, or do you want to do them at the same time? Uh, we can do them at the same time. I think that would be a lot of fun, actually. I think okay. that would be really interesting to really compare the terroir. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, the, the terroir is extremely different in this yeah. case. But uh, the style of tea, the look of the tea, I don't know if you've, you've opened them up and looked at them yet. I have, and I'm happy to show them off. So the, um, yeah. on my stream here, so the Cholo, T-S-F-B-O-P-1, um, is, is this tea here, this is what this looks like, this is the tea from Africa, if I can get the lighting to look okay. Um, it's a fairly broken grade tea, as we have mentioned. I don't know why I said that, I meant to say it. the leaves are very broken. It's broken. It's, it's been broken. Having, it's been having a lot of anxiety lately. Same. <laughs> <laughs> I feel this tea on a very emotional level. Um, so this is the Bengeti Pico, uh, which is uh, the Sri Lankan. Tea we're trying to get, so. And that uh, that translates that word, uh, Bengeti Pico. Well, Pico, we know that word, right? You've heard True. that word. Well, yeah. Orange Pico, everybody's favorite flavor of tea. <laughs> I remember the first time I tried that and everybody going, oh, the, that's an orange flavored tea. That's so cool. And I'm like, wait, but it doesn't taste like orange. I felt betrayed. It's yeah. Orange, orange peco refers to the leaf grade. So orange peco is actually in the name of this TSFBOP. Right. That's the OP at the end that's of this. Tippy spec. What? Okay. Can you just, what, what is it? Yeah. I think it's tippy special flowery broken, broken orange peco one being like the first grade so like the highest grade of that style so if there was a two after it'd be a lower grade of that style yeah 
that's what that acronym means. Um, and so, yeah, the PECO in the same case here, the PECO is um, like the two leaves in a bud. It's like the combination right. of, of the leaves and the buds. It indicates that there's going to be buds there. And um, Vangetti Everything means... Everything is fine. Vangetti means thieves. So it basically just means thieves tea. Thieves tea. Thieves. That's exciting. Oh, okay. That's mysterious, yeah? I'm already really into that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great story. I'm very happy and proud uh, to share that story because it's one of the unique, charming things about uh, this garden, where the tea comes from. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that when the time is right. I'll definitely uh, share those stories. And I have videos of how this tea is made, too. So... We'll get to see it. How do they get it so small yet so sweet? Because usually, like even like an expert tea buyer, if they see the the leaf looking like this, like broken up like this, they would probably just discount it, like discredit. Yeah. Like this is probably not going to be good. Uh, but both of these teas are actually very mild and very good. Um, Some one of my <laughs> interestingly. Um, oh, okay. I, I will put a pin in that thought and we'll come back to that one. Um, something that uh, somebody um, said to me one time when I was kind of first getting into tea, I was sharing, I was in a discord, I was sharing a picture of some uh, like long jing that I was drinking, right? And it was a fairly broken long jing. Um, the leaves like looked really nice when they were dry, um, but you know, as they got wet, you could tell that they were pretty cut and I th they looked chopped was the thing about it. Uh -huh. um, and they I, I somebody asked me where i got it from you know and i told them and they said oh well it looks a little bit too cut up for my taste and that was something that was really interesting and, and that actually shaped my opinion of tea for quite a while um and uh, of broken teas and i just assumed that oh if it's if it's broken leaf if it's um um cut leaf or whatever like that must be bad and what i found is that in green tea sometimes that's that can that can kind of not be great you know when you got broken leaf mm -hmm. but specifically in the black tea and i remember with the yankee teas that we were drinking mm -hmm. um the uh they were broken after processing and so mm -hmm. uh the that bitterness didn't come out the same as how you kind of explained that to me which made a little bit of sense i guess yeah and something that I've learned since kind of meeting you and getting and doing some of this podcast is that broken tea literally is not um, a quality sig signal at all. Like it can definitely influence the way it tastes for sure. Mm -hmm. um, like in the green teas that I've had, but for at least these black teas, that's really not the case at all. Yeah. Um, um, but no, I do support the statement that generally most broken teas are rubbish true yeah i'm not i'm not <laughs> saying it's that's not the case i'm just saying that blanketly yeah i should you shouldn't yeah assume that immediately um you yeah. should give the tea a taste but uh be mindful be cautious like if you're sampling a bunch of broken grades uh you, you may want to have a spittoon handy because yes they can be intense <laughs> they can be intense <laughs> they can be very intense yeah it's all the tannins it's mostly it's just tannin you know because yeah. there's two ways that tannins are uh, well, can be limited in a tea, and, and, and tannins, unless they're balanced, don't do really well in tea. Um, and so the first one is, you know, shading and protecting the plant, because that'll stop the tannins from being produced in the first place. True. And then the second thing that you can do is in processing, and that's keeping the leaf intact. Um, and... You know, both of these teas are broken during processing. And so that's what's kind of confusing. Um, and I don't know the magic trick of how they stop these to become too tannic. Um, and we'll, I'll show you video of, especially the Vangetti Pecco. I have a lot of video that we, we took when we, we went there and asked them specifically about this tea because it's a really popular tea on our catalog. All right, I'm sure you were already steeped. I'm just like, I warmed my wares. I'm just, oh, I'm about to decant now. You're going to decant? Okay, cool. Well, you can get a head start. That's fine. I'm not. Like, just off the decanting i can smell like chocolate and coffee almost mm, yummy. 
Everybody likes chocolate and coffee. Actually, I take that back. I've realized there's a lot of people that don't like the smell of coffee. They're wrong, but that's fine. <laughs> that was a fast one, Colin. <laughs> They're wrong. <laughs> So based off like, as far as like the liquor goes off my first one here, this Vengetti, Vengetti, Vengetti Pico is uh, much darker actually. It's like a bright, like like a like a deep ruby red color. Mm -hmm. It looks a little brown on my camera, unfortunately, which always sucks. But. taste no i was just giving the lids a sniff i'm gonna let them cool a little bit i've learned recently that drinking your tea scalding hot is actually really bad for you um <laughs> so i um uh, have decided that i i need to start letting it cool off but um so yeah that's a good idea yeah. you know uh, i judged a tea brewing competition in 2017 in Shanghai and one of the criteria that we had to judge them on was the temperature at which they served us the tea. There was like a whole bunch of criteria. Uh, it was a really cool competition actually where you know you had to guess the tea, guess its terroir and like describe it to the judges as you're brewing it for them and brew it you know to the best recipe that you can and even the temperature of the tea served uh, was noted, so you couldn't have it too hot. Um, and you had to prime your cups, but you couldn't, like, you had to empty your cups out immediately before putting the tea in, so the cup is still hot. Because, like, if you waited longer than 10 seconds after you, you know, you put hot water into the cup to, to warm it. Sure. If you if you pour that water out and the cup is sitting there for like 20, 30 seconds, then it's losing temp, and so you get docked on that. But then the tea itself, when it, it, it got served, needed to be the right temp. So there's a couple of ways to address that um, if you want to get that detailed in your tea service. And sometimes like having, you know, the wider, the wider cup with more surface area is one of those ways because... There's more surface area, so even when you pour it in here, it's gonna lose temperature faster if, mm -hmm. it's, if it's really hot. Um, or having like the large pitcher, you know, those large pitch. That's one of the reasons. It's not so that you can put more tea in it, but it's just the it extra. It stays hot surface. a little longer. No, it cools faster. Oh, it cools. Fa oh, true. Yeah, you're right. I, the more surface area will cool it faster. I took the information you were giving me, and my brain went backwards and sped <laughs> it back down. <laughs> Um, so that's, uh, I have like a few different sets of cups and I'm using my, uh, Ru Yao cups tonight because I like to use those with my darker teas. Um, and, but when I'm making, uh, there, there are certain teas that I'm, that I'm making if like I'm making them at like boiling where I'll get all like the, the larger cups that I have that are like a, nearly a hundred milliliter cups, you know, and they're like super wide and flat because my tea will cool off much more evenly and much more yeah. quickly and I can drink it faster. Um, that makes a difference. It does. Mm -hmm. but... All right. So what can you tell me, what, what tea do you want to talk about first? I guess uh, we're going to drink them both, but what do you want to talk about first? Well, you know, I mainly want to talk about the, the Vangetti Pecco. Um, sure. You know, that's my favorite. And I do have a lot of video um, that we can we can take a look at. Now, what these teas would be good for in the commercial setting or, you know, just in your personal life setting, um, these make for really good iced teas. Oh, I can, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, especially this TSFBOP1. The majority of the distribution of this tea goes to restaurants and cafes uh, to be used as iced tea and also as a base blending ingredient for like a breakfast blend. These are, you know, really punchy, um, really intense. And you can see the color. My colors are came out super dark. 
And yeah, it does it does look like the Van Getty Peco here, the one on the right, is more orangey in color. Say I've got I did about a thirty second steep on each of them and I've got like a, a, both of them are like this kind of ruby deep ruby color. Mm -hmm. Um with the uh the the T S F B O P one being just slightly lighter with like a maybe like a hint of orange to it, interestingly enough. So Okay, cool. All right. Drink up. I'm going. Uh, which one are you drinking first? I'm doing the Van Getty Pickle first. But... Yeah, you're right. You're right. You literally just said that. <laughs> we don't have to drink it in that order. Oh my. Oh my my my. This tea always surprises people. So, bear with me here. Okay. There's like a, a, a taste, a flavor to this that's almost like reminiscent of Chaux Pu'er. Okay. In the, there's a... Earthiness? Yeah, and A, it's, it's, it's not super tannic, which is wild, um, but it's, it's got this, like, kind of round bottom to it. Uh, I, I always feel like flavor comes in, like, almost like this, like, kind of ball, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, there's, like, this, this, like, bottom to it that's, like, super round and full um, that, that, that gives it that full body punch that I think you're talking about without bringing tannin to it. It yeah. still fills my mouth, you know, um, and maybe that's because of my like ratio to steep compared to yours, but I don't know what 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 are you what are you feeling? No, I'm having the exact same experience. Um, what's so surprising about this tea? First of all, yeah, is the lack of tannins that always freaks people out because they look at that. I mean, you look at this this wet leaf; it's all kinds of broken up. It's super deep in color. You would just assume that this is super tannic. Um, it looks like something that would come in a tea bag, honestly. Yeah, it looks like something that would come in a tea bag. Exactly right. And that's the thing about broken grades is that yeah, yeah, usually they are in a tea bag, and usually they are pretty crappy in quality. But um, this one surprises you. But then yeah. it also has this like really roundness to it. That was a good way that you described it. I like that. Um, and since you've said it, now I'm like really noticing on the bottom of my palate kind of this widening of. Of sensation underneath the palate you know a lot of times Hui Gan, when we're talking about Hui Gan, that feeling is coming from the throat over the top of the palate uh, sure. but this is actually kind of rounding out the bottom of the palate like I wouldn't necessarily assign Hui Gan to this tea it's it's not quite there um, no. but maybe it's... In... <laughs> I was just gonna say maybe if we re-steeped it it might you know if the leaves open up but I could yeah. see it being there but sorry I cut you it's off a, it, it's 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 a challenge with the broken grades. Now, this same exact factory or the same exact farm, uh, they make a uh, normal OP1, Orange Peco 1, so it's not sure. broken. It's just normal, uh, hand rolled. That one has Hui Gan. That's a beautiful tea that has Hui Gan. And so that's, when you taste those two teas side by side, then you really um, can tell the difference of how uh, masticating the leaf uh, does affect uh, the uh, the texture of the tea and that's the tannins because the tannins they denature enzymes and the main enzyme uh, well enzymes are flavor enzymes are amino acids mm -hmm. so one way I like to tell people to, to get them to remember that amino acids are associated with soft f texture in umami is uh, like liquid aminos you know which have become very popular as a cooking ingredient do you know about that? Um, no, I don't. And I also didn't, it was just now learned that amino acids have anything to do with umami, so. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Good, good, good. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, so your umami is all amino acids. Amino acids have like, they're proteins. Think about protein. Think about like the protein when you bite into meat. That tastes sure. and feels a lot different than when you bite into a lettuce that doesn't really have any protein to it. So. You know, the proteins do constitute a big part of, of texture, of thickness. And, and umami is actually, like, even though umami is our fifth taste sensation that we call, it, it's not really to do with taste. It's more to do with texture. It's more to do with, like, that thickness sure. that just, like, coats your whole palate. 
so I think about um, Gyokuro. Um, mm-hmm. That's um, umami. Right, and and I think about how every I've had a couple different kinds now, you know, a couple different uh, cultivars, um, and yeah, the same type of thing happens there, where that that like umami bomb like fills your mouth and it's like broth, like chicken broth almost, mm-hmm. you know, and it like coats your mouth and stuff, in kind of a similar type of way, I would say, and and this is this kind of a, I think is. Something that's interesting too, because uh, this is mildly off topic, and I'm just gonna go for it here real quick. Because Eat it. my parents are vegan, right? Um, okay. They're plant based. Um, I was vegetarian for a while when I was younger, and something that I always remember when I ate uh, meat again was um, that I suddenly felt like uh, I would, because I would feel full when I was done eating um, if I wasn't eating meat, but how satisfied I felt instead you know and and I feel like it, there's like a similar kind of relation between um, like re, like a, a, a typical green tea to like a gyokuro um, is 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 just that, that like satisfying thing but anyway back to black tea real fast you were saying <laughs> um, <laughs> we we're talking about amino acids and tannins and stuff yeah no but that's important it's important and so yeah if your yeah. parents are vegan I'm surprised that you don't know about liquid aminos because Oh, they're mm, <laughs> they're not into the science thing. They just well, it's like something at, at health food stores where you go buy your vegan food, your vegan ingredients. Like that's a main um, ingredient uh, that can provide umami to your diet. Which, when you're vegan, it's 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 kind of find hard to find that umami uh, sure. because it's kind of lower lower in protein, which is protein. So li- liquid aminos, for the most part, are extracted from, like, mushrooms. Um, it's MSG. It's MSG. God That's why MSG, MSG m- it makes things taste good, because it, it, plays with the, uh, it plays with the amino acids to give them more, um, you know, vibrancy. But uh, the, the tannins... <laughs> the tannins are... Um, scientists call them the most powerful bioweapons in the world because they denature amino acids and we may not care about that because that's on such like a molecular level and really really wouldn't make sense but uh for a tea leaf it's it's a big deal and it, it will totally cut through any type of um umami or texture that the or sweetness that the the tea may have uh, also, uh, L-theanine is an amino acid, so tannins will also kill L-theanine. <laughs> Which makes so much more sense why <laughs> tea drunkenness does not happen from, like, bagged tea. Yeah. Because of the tannin and, mm-hmm. like, the lack of L-theanine and that being related. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Elise, I'm... <laughs> How long have we been recording? So we've been literally live for 30 minutes and I, like, my mind has been blown, like, seven times. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that makes me feel good. You know, I have these kind of moments, too. Sometimes I have these moments by myself when I'm live streaming and I'm just like, oh, and now this makes sense. All these things are adding up, you know, and... This type of information is not in the conventional tea education. Um, you know, sure. even if you study tea in China, a lot of these concepts are, um, they're not intellectualized. They're not uh, talked about in scientific terms. Um, they're talked about in very kind of overarching romantic terms, such as Hui Gan, you know, like mm-hmm. that's... And, and, you know, when someone's talking about the quality of a, t- of a tea and talking about Hui Gan, a lot of times they're not. They're not talking about tannins or amino acids or, you know, any of the, the science type of stuff. So, um, yeah, definitely a lot of room for a book to be written. <laughs> um, would you like to see how this tea is made? Yeah. Cool. I'll, so, I'll give you a couple of sa- if you want me to share screen for you for your audience. Yeah. Um, we could do that. I'll give you time to to do. I'm also your gonna thing. start drinking the uh, the other one. The cool. other tea as Let's well. do that. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. And I'm I'm ready to go whenever. Just uh, flip over whenever you are. Okay. Mm. 
Um, real quick, um, since we're kind of in a low here, I have a question from my chat uh, about Wagon. Um, basically, okay. uh, Mizzou Murphy here is asking what Wagon is. I'm going to spell it in the chat here. Um, and as I understand, it's 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 it literally translates to returning sweetness. It's mm -hmm. related to like the finish of the tea, um, but has a little bit kind of more ambiguous meaning to that. But I think you would be better equipped to explain that. Oh no, in that's more detail. exactly it. That's exactly oh. it. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's not that complicated. Um, that, it's that. It's returning sweetness. Um, it is much more of a textural sensation than, than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, Say so it's it's kind of like when you when you when you swallow your tea, you know, and 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 you feel like that that kind of aftertaste in your throat, and then that kind of like flavor starts to come back, basically. Okay, so this is the metal um, a mortar and pestle that is used in processing this. This is the traditional method of making this tea. So you see the raw green leaf is in there. That's raw. There was just a, a little bit of withering that was applied to the leaf, but for the most part, sure. um, it's still very wet leaf, and it's just being masticated in this. And, and, and they'll do this for a while until it's broken into little pieces. Um, I wanted to show you this video before telling you why this tea is called Thieves Tea. Uh, the yeah. reason why it's called Thieves Tea is because this method of making the tea is actually a, the way that the workers of this area have been making the tea. And they, they work out in the tea field. So this um, Amba Tea Estate that this tea comes from is a... Um, now it's more of like a humanitarian type of project where they're rebuilding the community and but before it was just a normal tea estate with you know indentured laborers um, there and they would pocket tea they would pocket tea to take home and they would make this tea at home this way they would just bang it all up until it was masticated into tiny little pieces and then just let it oxidize um, and they, they make this tea as like an homage to to that story. Um, so, you know? yeah. And just a quick question. So the the basically, if I understand processing correctly, they break it up and then like leave it to allow it to oxidize. Yes. The breaking of it is essentially the, the similar process to like the rolling that would cause oxidation in a, I guess more orthodox tea sense, correct? Yeah, the rolling, or in the case of CTC, crushed hair curl. Yeah. That would masticate the tea, but they they use like a conveyor belt of like teeth that just like the tea all just gets. Yeah. Torn that's... up into little pieces. Um, but here but the... they're just doing it by hand, and it's a surprise though because they are breaking open all the cell walls and exposing all of the tannin if there is tannin there. So obviously, um, tannin is is reduced now that this is, is fascinating yeah um that's why like i i'm still trying to wrap my head around i can't fully explain why this doesn't have tannin um this is you know the the leaf where where this tea comes from it's you know not particularly shaded uh it is uh kind of like an agroforestry type of environment so there is some kind of like natural intermittent shading coming from the canopy of trees uh, in the agroforestry system. And the elevation here, it's like mid elevation. It's not um, a super high or, or super low. This, this looks like a good video that shows. Um, but yeah, th this tea garden is just, oh, this is the Lipton seat. That's a very famous landmark in, in Sri Lanka. Lipton, Lipton seat. seat. Yeah, it's called because of Lipton. You know, Lipton. Yeah. He got his start, or the company of Lipton, which was named after a man named Lipton. He got his start in Sri Lanka. That's where he started building his empire. And so which a lot makes of sense. yeah, a lot of landmarks and and important places there are named after Lipton. So, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that like landmark on the mountain, that like cliff. I'll show the video again so you can see that view again. But yeah, you see, there's not like a whole lot of shading. But hey, you know, I was talking about organic soil. That's it. That's what you want to look oh, for. Oh yeah, I was organic literally just soil. noticing. I was so literally this just is, noticing. This is uh, Lipton seat up there. That like little. 
Is that a farm up there? Is that a... Uh, I don't know what's up there. I think they... When I was there, I asked them what it is, what's still up there, and they said, oh, it's just um, like a uh, retired... There's a lot of retired tea gardens in Sri Lanka. There's Interesting. There's a lot of them. Um, so, yeah, it may have been one of Lipton's... Uh, let me see here. This is... Okay, not to not to completely distract from the Sri Lankan tea, but this uh, the Malawi tea, the Cholo uh, Cholo is mm -hmm. uh, also not very tannic. It still has yeah. that kind of same like roundness of like the Chopuer, but not not quite. It's not nearly as strong as the, uh, the Sri Lankan. Um. Yeah, it's not as strong. It's not as character. Like it, it kind of falls no. flat compared so. uh, to the other tea. But I'll tell you what, it's like a fifth of the price. Well, I was, <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, because even this Vangeti Peko is um, it's highly valued. This garden, they only produce ever all of their teas are made by hand. They don't produce more than twelve kilos of tea a day. You know, I'll, sh I'll show you. This is an example of their whole leaf black tea that they make. Everything done very much by hand in small batches, high levels of quality control. Uh, a really cool thing that they employed here, once they turned into like a development project for the area, sure. um, the, the tea estate had gone out of business and then new owners from Europe bought it and they wanted to treat it as like a co-op, you know, type of development project for the area. Uh, they recruited a woman who is now a tea grower in Scotland. Her name is Beverly Wainwright. She's she's quite famous. She was here at this place in, in Sri Lanka, I believe, for like four or five years. And she pretty much did all of the work of developing these hand processes as well as like record keeping, quality control. And this very unique uh, practice with labor where, uh, and I hate calling it labor, um, with right. the team with the team uh, <laughs> where uh, every member of the team has to work every position within the entire organization, including management. So uh, hmm. in, in most tea processing operations, everything is very siloed. The labor is very siloed. Sure. So you have like the women out harvesting and then the men work in the factory. And even within the factory, every employee just focus on their one thing that they they just do really well and then you've got the supervisor and the manager and they're always doing their thing but um uh and here at amba i think it's like every two weeks they have to rotate to a new position uh this is their withering bed so i just wanted to show it this is uh the the vangeti peko would go through the same withering like this here this is very good way of doing withering. I mean, this little pile I love here, those leaves. this little pile there is not very great, but you see how like the rest of it is all like a thin layer. And then yeah. the tray that it's on is a mesh. So there's airflow going all the way. Like that's really important with the withering. Um, I was showing you with the, the Yankee tea factory, the first week, their withering trough, they have, they call right. it a trough because they want like a thick layer, um, of leaves so they can produce more but then you get uneven withering uneven processing so this type of system is really good additionally outdoor withering which is is really how the the true artisans do it so like you know that's oolong, you know leaves you up uh, at the at the whim of the the elements so i can imagine that there's kind of a hesitation there mm -hmm. um yeah and then they uh they use just a normal dryer let me see if I can get a video of it. Here it is. This is the dryer. This is like a, a normal oven dryer, but everything is like very small scale processing. So they can't they can't really produce large scale. See, like that's the dryer. That's it. It's quite small. They can only fit a couple trays in there. So they can't be producing very large batches, which is why this Van Getty Peco is so uh, valuable see how, how much can fit in there that's it that's the whole dryer there it's quite small that's probably one of the smallest dryers of, of anybody that we work with say that looks like fewer than 20 trays per mm -hmm. side yeah it's it's really small but they're quite fine beverly you know when she spent her time there this is her let's 
Uh, she she's from Scotland, and she has a lot of contacts in Europe. So in addition to setting up all of the quality processing, she also um, set up a lot of their marketing and product position. Uh, they're in all of the highest end department stores uh, in mm. in London. Um, yeah, they're the fancy tea in Europe. This 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 garden. So they don't. Oh, wow. Yeah, they don't have to rely on you know large commodity sales. They they only work on these like artisanal, hand processed thing. And literally, the price of their teas is, you know, three to four times more than all other teas. Like between these two, I mean, this this cholo, the one that that you just were talking about, just drinking. That one is um, super cheap. It's so cheap. The shipping costs more than the tea. It's that cheap. Um, and we, you know, we work to get cheaper shipping because we do bulk importing. But the Van Gady Peco is um, is quite pricey. So like, I don't sell a lot of it, but I don't need to. Like, if I did find big buyers for it, if I came to Amba, they'd be like, hey, look at our capacity. We 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 wouldn't even be able to do a ton um, if if that order came. And I think that's great. I love this. I like. I love seeing these organizations leaning into the smaller scale versus, yeah. um, you know, in the case with Setembwa, uh, the 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 cholo tea that we're tasting, they have, um, they're kind of straddling the two worlds. All right, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna uh, turn the the screen share off. Um, they're straddling the two worlds. Uh, they are in a very similar position as Ambatia State, where they um, are kind of a failed estate, like financially not, you know, sustainable for the workers and for the land. And you know, the the owners want to flip things around and do something better. So at Satemba, what they're doing is they have you know, like a hybrid line where part of their production does go towards um, like quality tea like this. And then um, majority of their production is still going towards CTC. And it's, uh, it's understandable why a garden right. would want to do that because that's like what they've known. That's the business contacts they already have. Sure. That's, you know, they already have the factory for it, but the profit margin on that style of tea is just so, so low. And it just puts so much pressure on you. Um, and you know, it can get in the way of not only the quality control of like the higher quality artisanal teas that you're making, cause they do both. They have like a multiple factory thing but it also affects their brand because like they do have cheap tea. They do sell $2 a, t a kilo tea that anybody can get. And for, you know, people that are in business and like as buyers and, and facing their own margin struggles may be more attracted to the lower price tea without giving the credit that's due for, you know, the, the more artisanal craft um, sure. That, yeah. That goes into it. Say, I mean, at the end of the day, there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. So, like, let's go for the 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 least expensive thing on the market. You know. Yeah. And I mean, it makes sense because, like, at the end of the day, um, the, the dilemma seems very similar to like somebody that you know is a photographer or is a videographer. Um, <clears throat> I speak from experience in that you really want to just make your art you know you want to make the good stuff the 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 cool stuff the fun stuff but at the end of the day you also have to do something that makes money and if the ctc is what's making them money so that they can start to work a little bit more on um or 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 or, or market a little bit more some of the higher quality teas you know then i i think that's the best way to do it even if it's even if it's a slow road i guess but well, it's like, it's like, so the photographer example, it would be such a vast contrast of like, I've been a commodity photographer for years now, and the hourly rate of that type of business is, you know, $15 an hour, let's say. Um, but then there's this opportunity to be like more artistic and higher quality and more thoughtful 
and your photography, but it would also require you to create like a new brand and a new, you know, market for yeah. it. But in that one, you can make, let's say $200 an hour. It's mm -hmm. like that stark of a difference. And it'd be like choosing, okay, well, I'm just going to like tiptoe into this $200 an hour thing and, you know, start to do it and, and put myself out there for that. But I'm going to continue to do this $15 an hour thing because I already have clients that have already booked me and I'm going to just do it. And that $15 an hour gig, like as long as you continue to make yourself available, like you're going to continue to be hired and it's going to continue yes. to distract you from you know, putting yourself out there for getting those $200 an hour clients. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's would a, be it's, a good comparison. It's a double edged sword. And like my original example is like, you know, hey, this is beneficial. But at the same time, like you, you write in that, like there are downsides to the whole thing. And it's kind of this. Again, I feel like the conversation has turned back to being in the tea industry it is like constantly being stuck in between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> Why do we always come back here? <laughs> we gotta change this. We're gonna we're gonna change it one TikTok at a time, Colin. Come on. <laughs> one podcast episode at a time. <laughs> We'll do it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to happen. It's, it's going to happen. And you know what? It may not be our doing that's going to cause it to happen. Um, you know, it may just be uh, an issue of scarcity, an issue of economics yeah. in the market. And I don't know if we've talked about this on the podcast, but I'm going to talk about it over and over again because it's not talked about enough. Um, and it's very current and re very relevant to what we're dealing with right now. But with the pandemic, and all of the logistics challenges that have been coming, you know, mostly from China. It's mostly the exports from China. There's like such a huge demand for exports from China because we love Walmart. Um, we. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the pandemic has only grown that exponentially as like mm -hmm. we're sitting at home and shopping on Amazon and, and all of Amazon is even worse than Walmart. It's all coming from China. And, um, I'm guilty of it too, though. You know, I, it's okay. It's, yeah, I'm it not is, trying yeah. to shame anybody. No, it is what it is. Like, <laughs> it, it's just that's that's the again. There is no ethical consumption under capitalism. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not trying to brand this podcast as like super like socialist, but I'm just saying. <laughs> sorry. Go on. <laughs> Let's be careful of that, Colin. Anytime I start talking in that area, I start getting called a Marxist, and it's like, <laughs> and you're that's insulting cool. me. How? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, so there's been an increased demand for exports from China that has put a huge pressure on container containers, like the quantity mm -hmm. of containers. Mm, sure. there's, there's not enough containers uh, and China wants them and they're valuing those containers. So it's actually become profitable for freight companies to send empty containers to China so that China can have containers for their exports. Um, so from here, from Vietnam, from Japan, even from, from Europe, a lot of ships are sending empty containers back to China. And so that's creating delays in other countries. And so pretty much the entire supply chain right now is in a state of chaos. And no one, no one really wants to talk about it. Like the press doesn't want to talk about it. The banks don't want to talk about it because um, not only would people potentially like freak out and hoard. Like we saw with toilet paper. Yes, because that's what people do. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it could actually also affect the stock market um, because, you know, then people would be afraid that the market's going to collapse, which that's pretty smart to think. But um, uh, of course, the banks and the, the Wall Street, they don't want people thinking that. They want people thinking everything is okay. Um, sure. And so what does all of this have to do with tea? Well, in the problem that we were just talking about is when scarcity happens, when your balance of supply and demand starts to go off, if your supply goes down, but your demand is still where it's at or higher, that causes the price to go up. And... Um, these cheap things are no longer going to be cheap. And that's going to change the entire culture around consumerism. Um, and the valuable things like this tea here, 
the price of this thing is not affected at all because even if logistics costs go up, um, and speaking of, the logistics costs have gone up uh, because of the shipping container issue. If you really want your shipping container to go out, you want to prioritize in the line and really get your container out. Um, you know, it used to cost about $4,000 for a 40 foot container to ship from China here. Uh, it, not inclusive of uh, clearing fees or whatever, but just the container costs. It's not per kilo, it's just the whole container. Whatever you can fill in there, you can put it in there. It's 4,000 bucks, put it on a ship and it goes. Right now, it costs over thirty thousand. You know it costs over thirty thousand dollars to ship a container right now, Jesus. from China. So when your tea, right? So you think about like some cheap Chinese tea. You're paying four thousand dollars for the whole container. That's potentially twenty tons of tea. Um, you know, like that's like pennies per kilo to ship the tea. There, sure. that's what Walmart is is used to working within those kinds of margins, and then all of a sudden. It costs over thirty thousand to ship it, and that's going to increase your your logistics cost uh, too much. Yeah, that's yes. that's a huge increase. Thirty thousand, yeah, thirty thousand. It's only going to go up higher, and it's not not going to change. This problem's not going anywhere. I started talking about this problem last year already, and like at first people were like, "Oh, don't worry, it's just temporary. It's just temporary." And I'm like, "Well, hey, we're in a, we're a year in, and the problem is just getting worse." So like. Uh, scarcity is going to become a real thing and it's really going to affect our you know perception of the products uh, that for the most part we kind of take for granted we're not going to be able to take for granted anymore you just thrown a lot of numbers and figures at me and like my head is spinning all this <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot this is what you get for inviting a business person on your podcast yeah seriously I, <laughs> I know this is this is what's so funny to me is that like this li that 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 explanation there like was like this perfect example of like how your brain works i feel like i, I feel like that's like just this this really good example of you elise and i'm sitting here going okay all of this makes sense to me none of this is going to be retained <laughs> <laughs> it's okay we'll talk about it again next week <laughs> yeah we probably will um so so okay so tea is expensive this tea is expensive shipping is expensive there's a scarcity on containers mm -hmm. Damn. yeah so what you're going to start to see it i mean they've already uh, prices in the grocery store have already gone up like that's not a surprise i don't know if you've noticed that but a lot of people have started noticing mm -hmm. that and you know a lot of companies are still in this position of thinking that this is temporary and so they're justifying like taking financial losses um, you know, just to keep everything status quo, but there's going to be a point where they're going to be like, no, we can't do this anymore. Price going up, and it it could be a a really big price increase, but it's needed. You know, Sri Lanka. You know, we're talking about Sri Lanka here. It's a struggling tea industry. That's why there are a lot of retired tea estates because they just it's not profitable anymore. Like the cost sure. of tea, like. Even if you've got like the fanciest Ceylon tea, which by the way, Ceylon is one of those terms that's questionably canceled. I don't know. We want to talk about that or not. We can. I'm, I'm always so confused on that. Ceylon means Sri Lanka, but it's kind of like an Oriental and um, Orientalism type of a term. Um, Do we want to talk about that real fast? We could. Yeah, we could talk about it. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> clueless on that. I, I only know that Ceylon is Sri Lanka and that is it. Yeah, so it was a term that was assigned to Sri Lanka uh, when when it got colonized, and it was kind of like a romanticized marketing term. Um, there is some, like, um, actually there's not. There's not a connection to, like, ancient Sri Lankan history of Ceylon being connected to it. I think the actual connection is somewhere else, and I want to be right, so I'm going to look it up. Um, but it's definitely just like a marketing term that was applied to Sri Lankan products in the uh, international market, uh, of course, during colonialism, because I know Sri Lanka got um, colonized. colonized as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, it's like it's kind of like one of those words like uh, Oriental beauty is one of those, you know, words. OK, it comes from. Cielin. 
of the island that was known by the Romans. See, it wasn't even like a, uh, a Sri Lankan word. The Romans as serendipis, uh, seren serendip. So it's like a po like serendipity. It's like a positive word, but it like it, it was like a Roman word. It was like a, a well known, famous like Roman island that was known to be like beautiful and exotic and and perfect. And so when they colonized Sri Lanka, like that word, this idea of this like special exotic island was applied to Sri Lanka. So it's it doesn't even have like ancient Sri Lankan roots. Um, Elise, if I didn't live in an apartment building right now, I'd be screaming. <laughs> but it's yeah, it's Orientalism. It's it's exactly that. So if we want to be proper, we cancel that word. I mean, and it's not even our business to really cancel it, but. Like it's not going to hurt us to do that. Like in our own in our own efforts of being educators and talking about these things. Like, yeah. Um, but you I know, just, it's in, it's interesting. There's a guy on TikTok. I don't know if you've come across him. He's a Sri Lankan man that makes chai. Yes, he's love awesome. This man. Yeah, love I like this him man. too. Because and the reason I love him so much, a the content is great. Yeah. B, it's the way he always makes it a perfect loop. Uh huh. <laughs> That makes me so happy. <laughs> so goddamn happy. But yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he, he used the term Ceylon. He uses the term Ceylon. And I asked him, um, because I know it's not my place to educate him on this. It's not my sure. place to do that. It's his place to discover it for himself. Um, and to I, educate us. <laughs> and to educate us, exactly. So, like, I put in the comments, I said... Um, can you please explain the origin of the word Ceylon? Uh, as a, a T student, I have tried to understand this word, but there's only limited information on the internet. Can sure. you help me? And he wrote back to me, good question. And so I figured that he would have created some content around it, but he didn't. So uh, that didn't really work the way that I, I wish it would have, because I mean, that's how you deal with this is like you ask questions versus like gatekeeping or whatever you, you ask questions. Um, but 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 yeah yeah my camera just shook and um it, apparently it's bath time for my cat she likes to sleep underneath the camera and and it shakes when she moves oh so is bath time like punishment for the cat is that what that meant oh no as in she's bathing herself oh oh i see like licking herself and knocking the stuff yes yes okay got it got it got it uh, so yeah, that's that. We want to decolonize tea. That's that's the actions that we can do, and um, you know, like bringing this conversation up, especially with people that like that's their culture. You know, that's their story to tell. That's their education to give to the world. Um, and you know, that's that's like the nature of his content. You know, like even though he talks about chai, he always does it where he tells stories of like um, you know his culture and sure, um, yeah. But yeah, he, he uses that term Ceylon, and I was like, okay, that's interesting. I mean, I'm not the right person to gatekeep this for him, but like, I'll just ask him and see if he can help us out. Maybe I should hit him up again and be like, hey, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm really serious about this. I'll send you a bunch of really nice tea if you, uh, <laughs> if you could help me with this. <laughs> and just, so I don't know how much more, um, how much longer we're gonna go here, but I, I at least have one more thing I wanna just kind of mention on that because something that I think is really important in that is, so, so you, yesterday um, I had uh, my stream with Jesse, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from Jesse's Tea House, and we were kind of talking a little bit about, uh, I, 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 some, I went off, I got on my soapbox again. And, okay. and, and my big, one of my big soapboxes in regards to tea that I've kind of like come across here is that I'm kind of, I don't, appreciate when the tea is described in western terms like specifically like hey you know this tastes like this kind of wine or or you know like tea tasting tea is like tasting wine or anything like it's, 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 it's bullshit and and this to me and that that whole conversation of ceylon versus sri lanka who, who's allowed to you know, kind of have that have that discussion of, of, of what's right who's allowed to get, keep that the use of that word yada yada kind of makes me think of this in the Tea specifically, I, I, we, we have this need, it seems, in, in the Western context to clarify everything that is not Western in Western terms. And I don't, and I, I, it's something that I'm, I'm trying my best to kind of get over is, is just the, the, 
anything that's not Western is, is not incorrect because it's not Western, right? And specifically in regards to tea, um, like there are whole wars fought around tea. There are diplomatic trade routes built around tea. There are roads that are still around today that were built on, you know, tea trade routes. And I feel like the same thing kind of applies here with this conversation that we're having about Ceylon versus Sri Lanka and that like our Western view of this thing does not need to be taken into account for this to like struggle or this issue or this um, uh, uh, concept or anything like that to be legitimate and it's just I don't know there's something I'm kind of thinking about um, yeah. in regards to that kind of maybe think on, on those lines so yeah yeah so hopefully somebody listens to this podcast and gets inspired and decides you know they're gonna educate us which would be great yeah. um, it's not our place but you know what is our place to control our own behaviors mm-hmm so, like, as a merchant that sells tea from Sri Lanka, I have made the conscious decision that I've canceled that word, you know, for myself. At least not, on your shop, yeah. Yeah, at least on my shop. You know, I know I brought it up in this podcast, but I know that that's a topic that is important to you and you want to talk about. Uh, but you don't see me regularly in my content gatekeeping that type of stuff. Like, if someone right. asks, and hopefully, like, the answer can come directly from the source or directly from somebody that, you know, is from that experience or from that culture. Yep. I've got an interesting question here, actually. Um, mm-hmm. So isn't putting it in Western terms just an attempt to not gatekeep it, make it easier for different people to understand so that they can learn more of the traditional history and terminology? And I think my initial kind of reaction to that is is more that I understand what you're saying in that, like, if, if you're, like, in if we're talking about like the introduction of the concept like if we want to say oh like this tea reminds me of like a red wine so that somebody can understand like oh yeah i've tasted a red wine yeah that makes sense i can understand that i just i mean more along the context of like when i you know started to really um learn more about tea i had a lot of uh people that would come into my shop say oh so you know like I bet that's a lot like wine and, 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 you know, like, you know, tea has a lot of similarity to wine. It's, you know, you'd mentioned terroir and they go, Oh, just like wine and stuff. I'm like, well, you know, like tea is its own thing. So I just mean more that like, it doesn't need to be like wine to be legitimate um, because that's like the most common. But like, if you, if you wanted to say also, you know, just saying this tastes like red wine is not helpful. Tell me what kind of red wine. <laughs> so, but I don't know. At least what do you think? Yeah. Cause like, uh, there's a lot of different red, red wines, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like saying this tastes like tea. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, but that was, that was an interesting question. That was an interesting question. Yeah, I yeah. don't know what to do about this. I'm very conflicted um, and still trying to wrap my head around, because, like, we're in the thick of it. We're in the middle of it as educators. <laughs> All right, I... I, I uh, I see a TikTok coming up. We we gotta up our TikTok game. Oh get more yeah, out I there. need to get back on that grind. Yeah, I've been spending too much time on this other live streaming app that I uh, I'm abandoning TikTok. Um, but yeah, we're we're in the thick of like educating and talking about these subjects, and of course we could completely evade the whole thing. We really could, and just say you know not our. What do they say that not 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 my monkeys, not my baby. Not, my, not my circus. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, my friends always said, not my baby, not my problem. <laughs> I guess that tells who the type of people we hang out with. Yeah, I hang out with circus performers and you hang out with a bunch of baby daddies. Cool. Got it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. They're, it's not their baby. They're not baby daddies. I got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. <laughs> we're, we're tramping through the tea. On and on and on we steep. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so, like, we could evade it, and everything would be fine. For the most part, most tea companies are completely evading it. That's why you're not hearing most tea companies. I mean, uh, when was the last time you heard Lipton talking about colonization? I mean, of course not. They're not going to address it. Like, they, they have only benefited from it, so they would never. <laughs> yeah, they would never talk about it. Um, but even some companies like my own have had taken the choice of like, I'm, I'm, I'm just here selling my tea and I'm not going to get involved. They say it's all politics. And I'm like, no, this is not politics. This is civility. And civility is like completely different than politics. We're talking about how we can be nice to each other. We're not talking civility. politics. Civility. Yeah, civility. 
Okay, I'm too <laughs> drunk. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, if we do choose to engage with this discourse and contribute to it, um, you know, we have to be really cautious about how to proceed and make sure that we are amplifying the right voices and not speaking over, you know, and... Um, for me, that's been a big struggle over the past few months because I'm, I've found myself not publicly, but in intimate conversations with the like highly acute experience and knowledge that I have about these cultural subjects. Um, yeah, kind of over speaking and, 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 and realizing and, but this, these are intimate conversations with friends. So it's, it's, it's like there's space for back and forth and um, it's really hard because sometimes people don't want to have to do that work for learning their own culture and they definitely don't want to hear it from a white girl so so yeah I something that I struggle with sometimes making tea like this uh, and and making content around it is like I'm a I'm a I'm a white boy like is this is this you know um, and I don't say that with like the, like somebody tell me it's okay, you know, like it is, but ultimately at the end of the day, I think that as long as there is understanding that this is not my culture, um, and, and appreciating that culture that, the, that this thing, that this practice that I enjoy comes from is, is more important than anything else by, by doing stuff like this, by making the tea talks, by doing the stream. Um, where I, you know, when I make tea, I make sure to talk about the tea, talk about where the tea comes from, and then also making these podcasts. And I think that um, ultimately, because something that I think gets talked about a lot is um, when you have a platform, you should use it. Yeah. And so, you know, my platform may be relatively small in comparison to others. However, um, that doesn't mean it can't grow. And I figure I, you know, you and I are in a unique position where we live in a time where we have access to the technology necessary. And so why not share this story, right? Yeah, yeah, share it. And ideally, um, you know what? Now now that we've had this talk, uh, the next time we have tea from Sri Lanka and we talk about Sri Lanka, I'm going to have um, the guy from Amba Estate phone in, video call in. Yep. And we'll ask him. We'll let him explain it. And uh, yeah. I, I will uh, discuss it with him beforehand so that way... Um, you know, because sometimes, like, uh, uh, these issues that we're talking about, about culture and respect, it's kind of weird. And, you know, like, it's something that, like, as Americans that are, like, in the thick of it, like, trying to navigate this and how to be friendly with each other, um, it's hard for us to understand. But, like, in Asia, like, in Sri Lanka, like, it's a non-issue there. Mm-hmm. You know, like, the... You know, they don't understand, like, why are you pissed off about cultural appropriation? Like, we're not pissed off. We're happy to see you practicing our culture and respecting our culture. And it's like, well, you know, like, uh, there's a different viewpoint here that's not being considered. For the most part, it's, like, the, the diaspora of people that are actually, like, struggling and, and, yeah. and kind of leading this discourse. Um, because, yeah, people, like... People in Sri Lanka, like, in Sri Lanka, you do not see things called as Ceylon. Like, I, I think the word has, like, kind of retired. And then even when it's always just been really applied to tea. Because tea yeah. was the main, you know, international export. And so that term was really only assigned to tea. So, like, in Sri Lanka, people living their day-to-day there, like, they don't care at all about Ceylon. They probably never even hear that word or, you know say it has no significance and Mm -hmm. that was something i was actually gonna mention and ask about too was just and and you you answered it there was just yeah i i've never seen that term outside of t yeah it was definitely a marketing term it was really just a marketing term um that's still stuck and um said the the twinings bag is ceylon orange pico you know like that's that's a that's a marketable title and, and especially with the context of that if, if you understood that at the time that 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 you know blend was being released um what ceylon you know referred to culturally historically like that yeah that's that i, I don't know that's yeah that's i i have nowhere else to go with it that is all i'm saying yeah 
But um, I've never heard a Sri Lankan person offended by the word. I've only heard um, white people commenting on the history. Yeah. Um, and so there's validity to that. But I, I would like to hear it from somebody, like, once they do their own research and realize, oh, yeah, the, we, we need to reclaim this whole thing and, and, and do it the way that we want to do it. Yeah. But, yeah, there was a, there's a very interesting discourse going around on, on TikTok right now around a woman in Hong Kong that made a video, um, you know, talking about how Asian people don't understand cultural appropriation. And if they see somebody, you know, wearing their cult, like a white person wearing their cultural garb, like, they actually like that. Um, and mm. the discourse in return has been Asian Americans speaking up and saying, Hey, well, like, that's your perspective, but our perspective is very different. And like, we have to deal with being an outsider and being like, uh, not considered truly Asian by Asians in Asia. And it's like, but we, we are still, and this is still our culture. Like, you know, we still grow up in our homes, learning the language and learning the culture. Like it still is our culture. And, you know, we get ostracized for practicing our culture. Um, but then, you know, someone else practices it and they get celebrated. Like that's, that's the key there. And that's why it's really important as like, we are sitting here drinking tea. I mean, I'm not to say that we're being celebrated right now, but like, it's cool, you know, people would say, oh, this is cool what you're doing. Um, you know, someone in Asia, like, may, or uh, Asian American or Sri Lankan American may feel differently. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's not the right example, but I don't know. Yeah. It's it's a difficult thing, and uh, we're taking it on, Colin. It's, uh, <laughs> we're, we're doing it. <laughs> in the thick of it. <laughs> well, Elise, would you, um, I think say we, we've hit a, a good point here Do, shall we call it a night for the yeah we the could um, are there any questions yeah so actually I've just gotten rated um, oh yeah yeah so welcome in Medusa to Sedusa and your chat uh, how are you doing tonight um, this is Elise um, Elise is the owner of Tea Let Tea uh, which is a uh, Elise I'll let you talk about your company for a second <laughs> cool awesome yeah thanks for uh, letting me introduce myself yeah I'm uh, Elise uh, Tea Let Tea I, I do have a Twitch channel as well if you want to check it out I like Colin do create tea content I'm a tea streamer um, but uh, Tea Let is a software company it is a B2B marketplace that facilitates trade between independent family owned farms and tea business buyers um, and uh, yeah, Colin and I have been doing this podcast on Mondays where we drink a different pairing of tea to understand uh, and develop a intuitive knowledge about tea and how it's processed. And tonight we've been drinking two different broken black teas, uh, one from Sri Lanka and one from Malawi, Africa. Yeah. And, and um, I... I actually really enjoyed both, despite, you know, like my hesitation of broken grape teas. Yep. But that was really cool. I knew you would. And that's why yeah. I put this in the sample pack. I'm like, oh, because I heard you say something in one of the first pod or one of the first times that we ever talked. I did hear you say something about, you know, when it's broken or um, and I was like, OK, I got to I, I got to introduce them to, to to high quality broken teas. But I actually know exactly what, what, what I said, and I actually know exactly what, you're, what you said. I, I remember that moment clearly all of a sudden, and I don't know why, but I remember that moment very clearly. Um, uh, but I, I did want to make a final note. Like, I am on my second infusion of both the teas, and something that I've noticed side by signing them is that, yeah, there's a lot of commonality between the aroma, just like yes. the general character of the tea, like very similar. But um, uh, when it comes to the terroir, the uh, Malawian tea has much more, like, when you're talking about the earthiness, because you, you had noticed that both of them have, like, an earthiness to it. The Cholo, or the Malawian tea, the earthiness feels more like clay. Yes. Like, I, do you remember when you were a kid and you ate Play-Doh? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a flat earthiness. There's, yeah. like, there's, like, no texture or movement to it, yeah. but, like, it's there and it's Yeah, just well, in... well, this one, the earthiness feels like a very vibrant, fertile soil like very sweet and yes you know very complex medusa is like that explains a lot actually i don't know what it is about like having <laughs> eaten play-doh or clay but 100 percent that like i ate like, a lot of play-doh back in my day oh 
I never learned my lesson. I don't know if that's something you admit, Elise. I never learned my lesson. I'm just like, okay, I tried it before. Let me try it again. Maybe it tastes. Maybe the different color tastes better. Nope, that tastes bad too. <laughs> well, when I was a kid, I was really upset that the strawberry shampoo did not taste like strawberries. So Ooh, I, that's that's that a big one. one. I I never did that. That's a big one. That's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> well, Elise, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Um, this is fun as always. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna. I, I'll have some edited stuff to show you, um, like, super soon here. Sweet. And, I'm not in a uh, hurry. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm not, like, in a hurry in a hurry, but, like, I would like to start posting stuff soon. So. Cool. I mean, um, you're always welcome to post some thirst traps to your, your TikTok. <laughs> if you're talking about posting something. That was a <laughs> wonderful way of, of describing, of describing <laughs> that. That made me really happy. <laughs> Oh, man. We're great and comfortable with each other. I think that's what's going yeah. on, Colin. I agree. <laughs> Have a lovely evening, Elise. I will con I will, I'll hit you up later in the week. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll talk soon. Yeah. Have a great week. You as well. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right. All right. That's fun. That's always fun. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for hanging out. Uh, I do appreciate. Um, I'm doubled up. I'm doubled up here. Let me, um, you know what I should just do? Just do that. Cover myself up. Um, yeah, thank you for hanging out on the podcast. That was at Vodka Studio. I believe I have it in the title on the, um, the Twitch page, but, um, he is a new tea lover, content creator, and we are collaborating on this, this podcast. Um, if y'all have any additional questions about tea or my work or anything, I'm happy to answer that. If not, I'm going to be tuning out, man. I got done early. Twitch, what's up? Jim, you still here? Thanks for that emote. Thanks for, thanks for repping your, your buddy, your buddy pal, Elise. Into the thick of it. Into the thick of it. Now I got that stupid song in my head. Damn. You know what? I didn't even have music on this whole time. That's okay. We had enough conversation going on. The organic tea chip. Yeah, I, I took a sip for you. Did you notice? Does that make you feel happy? I'm not ashamed that I ate Play-Doh when I was young. Come on, people eat Play-Doh all the time. A deep discussion tonight. Yeah, Jim. You know, Colin, he's into that. Like, even from the very first time I talked to him, we did like a video call when we first met on TikTok. He was very interested in this, this topic about decolonizing tea and how tea is actually a major product that does need to be decolonized. Um, so I know that that's something that he wants to be bringing up in this podcast. Let me get some. Oh, this song is called Full Ham. I know this player's crackety. Yeah, Jim is cool. It's good to see you, Jim. How you been? How's your, your, your weekend was nice. I haven't seen you since Friday. Thanks for hanging out with us on Friday night. I did finish that challenge, Jim, by the way. So I believe the next time I stream at nighttime, I will do the fire spinning. I'll try to do it right at sunset because a lot of the people that support me on that app um, that want to be there and watching it are on the East Coast. Yeah, they're on the East Coast. So I want to make sure I'm not doing it at like 2 o'clock in the morning their time. Because it was my choice, that's when I'd do it. You know me, I'm a night owl. I'm a night owl all the time. That bro Cisco.
It was very hot. It was very hot here too. It's hot today. I'm all sweaty. That's why I'm like kind of red in the face. It's pretty hot. And I turned my fan off. Actually, I could turn it on now. I turned it off because we are recording a podcast, so I wanted to make sure the audio sounded good. My boom mic picks up this fan. It gives it a droning noise. Are there any friends on that we can go raid? Nope. I think I'll just end. Oh, you're going to finally cool off to under 80 tomorrow? Damn, we're probably not going to cool off to under 80 for another, like, four months here in Vegas. Okie dokie. Yeah, I'm going to tune out. Uh, Tomorrow night, I'll be back playing some games. I play uh, Gods Unchained. So if you are into crypto, of course, if you're into tea, I'm always drinking tea during my streams. So if if you're into the tea, give me a follow, hang out with us. Uh, On Tuesdays, I do play uh, Gods Unchained. Wednesdays, uh, we have Practicing Safe Sex, which is a very intellectual conversation um, with some AI sociologists. They're AI experts and sociologists. Uh, They're they're not AI sociologists. That sounds weird. No, they're actual real people, but they are AI experts, um, algorithm builders. so I look forward to that. I'll see y'all tomorrow night for some gaming. Thank you so much for the award, the helpful. I do appreciate that. So much love to all of y'all. I hope you have a good rest tonight. And we'll be seeing you soon. Bye, Jim. Have a good night. Goodbye, my friend. I'll see you next time.